This is a film about the most intriguing 20th century artist you may never have heard of. At least, I hope it's a film about him, rather than one that just goes in search of him. Because above all, he's an enigma. His name? Edward Burrow. His character? Diffident. Self-contained. No wonder, perhaps, he spent his life trapped inside a crippled body. For him, I think, there were only two escapes. Painting and travel. He loved Paris and France and came here often. And if you know where to look, you can still find echoes of the city he knew and loved. Bonjour. Je cherche la musique favorite d'un peintre anglais qui vivait ici dans les années 20. Les années 20, hein. Oui. Je crois qu'il aimait beaucoup les big bands. Merci. Je sens que Edward Burrow would have been very happy here. the Barrow Rhythm. His name may not be familiar, but Edward Burrow is one of the overlooked geniuses of British art and one of the most acute chroniclers of the 20th century. Although his is definitely not the official version of history. He painted humanity's dark side. It's warmongers, lowlifes, and outsiders. Illuminating dark and murky corners wherever he went. His idiosyncratic tour of the 20th century is strange, unsettling, and always compelling. Edward Burrow died in 1976. I never met him. And I'm not sure how well even his very best friends really knew him. Certainly I'm not sure how much they ever knew about his art because Burrow was quite possibly the single most elusive British artist of the 20th century. He very, very rarely talked about his enigmatic images. In fact, he was so reticent that he didn't even like to give them titles. And he only ever gave one interview to the media, and that was a filmed interview that he conducted towards the end of his life. It's rare footage, not very often seen, and they keep it here in the archive of the British Film Institute. Here it is. Recorded four years before his death, the interview shows an artist deeply uncomfortable about revealing anything of himself or his art, a man who hated being interviewed, who would much rather be doing what he does best. I'm just bored. I don't know what to do. What would you be doing if we weren't here? Painting. Born in 1905, Burrow was a delicate and sickly child, plagued by illness. From a very young age, he suffered from chronic debilitating arthritis. His joints began visibly to deform from the age of five or six, and the pain never left him for the rest of his life. His one buffer against the hand fate had dealt him was prosperity. He was the son of a rich lawyer. Burrow would never need to earn a living. He was born in this house, Springfield near Rye, and would spend much of his life living here with his mother and his father, a semi-permanent invalid, always forced to return to this, his refuge and main painting space. The window is one of Burrow's earliest pictures, painted when he was still a teenager. Like many of his works, its whereabouts is uncertain, and it's known only in black and white reproduction. It's an image that reveals his sense of his own predicament with piercing clarity, 
An ambiguous figure sits on this side of the window. Not wheelchair-bound, but certainly chair-bound, while outside life in all its vigour goes on. Two girls can be seen through the window, perhaps his sisters, little Betsy and Anne. But the central figure, Burroughs' alter ego, remains fixed and frozen in place. It's as if there would always be a sheet of glass between him and the world. He could look, but not touch. Throughout his childhood, Burra escaped the limits of his own body through painting and drawing. Art had become the most important thing in his life. And at the young age of 15 in 1921, he decided to escape Rye for the Chelsea College of Art in London. He loved London's spirit of limitless possibility, but it was the hidden, darker side of the city that he caricatured in many of his early drawings. Burrow received a fairly straightforward art education by the standards of the early 1920s, with a very strong emphasis on draftsmanship, which perhaps helps to explain his very confident and strong sense of line. But equally important to him were the friends he made at art school, lifelong friends, Clover Pritchard, the future photographer Barbara Kersima, and the future ballet dancer Billy Chappell. And what they had in common was a great sense of fun, and as Burrow later said, essentially frivolity. We spent all our time going to the cinema and reading Vogue magazine. And I think those things too filtered straight through into his art. Burrow developed a lifelong love of the cinema, especially B-movies and cheap serials, which he could enjoy while he was sitting down, one of the few positions in which he was comfortable. What Burrow took from the cinema was his sense of composition. He was always very fond of extreme close-ups or plunging vertiginous perspectives or close cropping. He goes for these heavily made up faces with Cupid's bow lips and rather exaggerated expressions, just as you see them in the old silent movies. Films like The Hazards of Helen also hinted at the darker sides of human nature. They're full of undercurrents of sex and violence and crime. And right through to the end of his life, Burrow would retain a deep affection for schlock horror, trashy movies. As well as going to the movies, the young Burrow went to galleries of modern art, absorbing the new languages of cubism, collage and abstraction, a mix of influences soon to be reflected in his own work. The snack bar is unusual for Burrow in that it's one of his very rare oil paintings, and yet I think it is a classic Burrow image and it gives us a wonderful snapshot of where he's at as an artist in his early maturity. He's clearly fascinated by Leger, by Picasso, by painting the modern world as a kind of collage of startling detail. The wood grain of a door, the tiling of a floor, the texture of a bar counter. But I think what makes it quintessentially Borough-esque is the sense that underneath the apparently innocent surface of the scene, all kinds of rather disturbing currents seem to be running. The young woman shoveling what George Melly once called a distinctly phallic sandwich into her mouth wears the clothes and makeup of a cheap whore. The blank faced young foodmonger seems to be cutting into that piece of sausage with disturbing relish. Could he be dreaming the dark thoughts of a schlock horror sex murderer? <laughs> In 1925, Burrow had travelled to Paris to see the great city of modern art and modern life at first hand. He arrived when Paris was at its peak as a centre for the avant-garde, and the city would change Burrow forever. Burrow loved the energy and the dynamism of Paris, and he particularly loved the city at night. And I'm on my way to one of his favourite haunts, one of the most famous places in all of Paris. There it is the Folie Bergère with its orange neon sign. And right in the middle, you can see this huge frieze showing a cavorting dancer with her pneumatic limbs and her short bob, the classic image of the 20s flapper. And that image of a dancing woman 
letting all her inhibitions go, that would come to occupy centre stage in Edward Burroughs' imagination. Les Folies de Belleville is Burrough in the first flush of his love affair with Paris. But what an ambiguous love affair. Right of stage, the cross-legged dancer, her modesty protected by a piece of diamante the size of a postage stamp, stares out at the audience with fierce impassivity. Her trailing hand reaches out towards the phallic dagger thrust nonchalantly into the black dancer's loincloth. This is the spectacle of sex, the promise of sex, without the slightest prospect of sex. All sex could ever be for Edward Burrow, his own predicament mimed in the harsh, angular forms of a stage show. I met Sandrine Voilet, an expert on Parisian popular entertainment, backstage at another famous night spot of the 20s, the Music Hall des Champs-Élysées. So here we are, one of Burroughs' favourite Paris hangouts. And I get the feeling that it probably hasn't changed that much since he no. was here. It hasn't changed since 1925 when La Revue Negre actually opened. So this is how it would have been when Josephine Baker was dancing for the Parisian bourgeois. Wow. <laughs> When she appeared, there was like a huge scream. People were gobsmacked. <laughs> Imagine the effect on the male audience. <laughs> Except poor Edward Burrow. He said he only had one erection in his whole life and that was watching Mae West in the movies. Maybe there was a tremor when he saw Josephine Baker. <laughs> Josephine Becker really epitomized the new style of a woman showing her body, not having a corset anymore, having short hair. So she's really uh, the modern woman. Now what's behind this embrace of black culture and American culture? There is a real appetite for pleasure. People want to really put behind them the trauma of the First World War. And people who can afford to go to nightclubs and cabarets come here to have fun. You call that uh, the Roaring Twenties, we call them Les Années Folles, the crazy years. So it's the party after the trauma? Absolutely. The straight jacket that has held the continent for four long, tragic years is loosened, and Paris, the heart of the continent, lets herself go. Post-war Paris really was a party town. The streets of Europe's major cities were full of reminders of the brutality of World War I. Crippled bodies of young soldiers who'd been literally dismembered by shrapnel and machine gun fire. So no wonder there was such an appetite in the nightclubs for the spectacle of young, unblemished dancing bodies. Burra loved the un-English exuberance of Paris. He sketched the dancers of the chorus line, advancing on the audience like a new model army, stormtroopers of liberating decadence. By day, he went to the record shops, where you could buy the soundtrack to this new era of social and sexual freedom. The new music known in Paris as le jazz, or le blues. And he painted the favourite of his hangouts, a store on the boulevard Clichy called Minuit Chanson, Midnight Song. It's glorious, he wrote to his friend and fellow painter Paul Nash. You put bits in the slot and listen to gramophone records. The clientele is enough to frighten you a little bit. What with listening with one ear and looking at the intrigues going on elsewhere. The people are glorious. Such tarts all crumbling and all sexes and colours. As well as record shops and music hall entertainments, Burra loved to paint Paris's bars and cafes, dwelling on the minutiae of their cheap decor. Brightly patterned tile floors, gleaming chrome counters, steaming coffee machines and he was fascinated by their ever-changing clientele. The whole city was, for him, an unfolding entertainment, a kind of living cinema. Barra also travelled to the south of France, where he was drawn to the seamier port towns, like Marseille, with their air of abject poverty and their picturesque shabbiness. 
In his dockside cafe, there's a palpable sense of boredom and seediness. Men hanging around with no real place to go. And maybe there's more going on at the counter between the greasy matelot and the fanged barmaids than the mere purchase of a cup of coffee. As in Paris, Burrow was drawn to the nightlife of the port towns, in particular their Spanish-style flamenco establishments. Here, in a painting called Flamenco Dancer, I think he's compressed a whole lot of different memories of the things he experienced on his travels. It's an image of a sexual predator. Burrow has depicted her as a cross between a femme fatale and a dangerous insect. He's made her train resemble the sting of a scorpion, her male victims completely entranced. And for once you get the sense that Burrow, the sexual outsider, the man on the outside of life, is quite glad to be there. He's watching what's going on and feels he's happy he's not part of it. Over here, as so often again in Burrow, you get this huge foreground detail. Perhaps she's the next flamenco dancer to perform, and perhaps she's wondering if she can live up to the example of her rival. It's a picture full of hallucinatory details. And look at this almost storybook image of a boat under the moonlight. I don't think any one experience inspired this image. I think it's an example of exactly what Burra did with the excitement of all that he'd seen abroad, compressed it into a single image full of colour, light, vigour and sexual energy. Burra's art isn't the only record of his youthful peregrinations across France. He was also a prolific letter writer. I've come to the Tate Archive to meet Jane Stevenson, his biographer, to see whether his letters might add more pieces to the puzzle of the man. Jane, how much time did you spend here in the Borough Archive at the Tate? It's quite hard to remember now, but the main, main point was it was such fun. I mean, it just went. I get the feeling sometimes that he was a man who, who almost lived through his correspondence. That, that... Well, well, he did, because he was so disabled. He must have written at least one letter a day for his whole life, so um, at the very least he thought it was worth it. I think he wrote the way he drew, which is actually by holding the pen or brush static and really moving from the shoulder. And how much of his personality do you think is reflected in these letters? Well, what you get from the letters, really, is the observation. Um, this one, I mean, this <laughs> is... <laughs> That's fantastic. He loved the sort of distinction between people trying to be smart and cool and uh, what they actually looked like. But you get the sense from that, don't you, of this appetitive eye, mm. th th that he's sort of eating the world up with his eyes. He is. And then writing it down and then transforming it into these cartoons which mm. are seen through this rather camp, caricatural and yet somehow also affectionate sensibility. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Do you think there's a sense in which he sees life as a kind of theatre? Yes. Um, what we have is the important question of whether their mutual friend Billy has or has not lost his virginity. Billy Chapel, yes. the dancer. And pray, dear, from whom did you hear that our little pox had been had? I must try and find mm. out. Um, <laughs> so that's so, Burroughs' love of gossip. That's Burroughs' love of gossip, all right. Um, they'd have loved text messages. <laughs> Burroughs' life as an artist fell into an unusual pattern, forced on him by his illness. Exciting bursts of foreign travel would be followed by long periods of enforced rest back with his parents in Sussex. I think Edward Burrow was a complicated mixture of the bohemian and the conservative, and nowhere is that encapsulated more than in his attitude to his hometown rye, where he was born and where he would die. On the one hand, he loved to complain about it, to mock what he saw as its aura of suffocating gentility, its tea shop coziness. He called it Tinkerbell Town. But on the other hand, he needed it. This was his recuperation zone. He'd come back here after his adventures overseas with his store of images and memories. This was where he would actually create the vast body of his work. Burroughs' method was idiosyncratic. He'd form a picture in his mind and then simply paint it from left to right as if rolling it out of his imagination. You can see the process very clearly in this unfinished landscape from the end of his life. 
Burra's arthritic hands were too weak to hold anything except watercolour brushes, so almost all his works, however large, were carried out in watercolour. But watercolour used thick and heavy, like oil paint or gouache, to give as much density and substance to every image. In one of his most playful paintings, The Tea Shop, done just a year after Les Folies de Belleville, he imagined the scantily clad dancers of the Parisian nightclub scene descending on some staid tea shop in Rye, serving tea and cakes to a thoroughly bemused clientele of bowler-hatted, newspaper-reading, repressed Englishmen and blue-rinsed ladies of a certain age, one of whom, to her astonishment, is having a pot of tea poured over her head by none other than a smirking vision of Josephine Baker herself. But if his art was meticulous and carefully constructed, real life was not so obliging. Because of his personal fragility, I think Burra always had a very keen sense of mortality, but death actually entered his life for the first time with the passing away of his maternal grandmother. They were very fond of each other, and Burra was particularly horrified. He, he kept the image with him until the end of his life. He was horrified by how long it took them to lower her coffin into the seemingly bottomless pit of the grave. But while the death of his grandmother was sad, it wasn't entirely unexpected. She'd lived a long life. But a genuine tragedy would, very shortly afterwards, befall the Borough family. It was here at Springfield in 1929 that real tragedy befell the Borough family. His younger sister Betsy, with whom Edward was very close, fell mortally ill with meningitis. Betsy's bedroom was just off the landing at the top of these stairs. And at the very end, Borough spent his sister's last day watching her die. And that night he stayed with her, keeping a long vigil. And I think it's as if this man who spent so much of his life living through his eyes wanted to drink her in one last time, wanted to fix her image on his retina, preserve her at least as a memory that could never be obliterated. He hasn't got a vocabulary to handle it. You know, he and his friends are all busy being smart at each other and um, witty and observant. So there isn't room in that world for genuine tragedy. The most significant thing to me is a long letter, which is mostly about other subjects. Brenda Dean, Paul, skinny dipping, sort of idiot things like that. And, and uh, he's obviously re written this and then looked at, looked at the letter and he ends up writing in the margin at the bottom, believe me, I feel her death very much. Burroughs' response to sadness, at least in early life, was never to dwell on the pain. And during the decade that followed Betsy's death, he seems to have been even more determined to escape his troubles by travelling to foreign cultures, none more so than America. <laughs> For Borough, America had an attraction unlike any other country in the world. He journeyed there many times in his imagination through the jazz and cinema that he loved. When he finally visited in 1933, aged 28, he stayed in Harlem, which had a profound impact on him. He loved the style and attitude of black New Yorkers and the rhythm of the streets. He was having the best time when he was in New York. I think he was really enjoying himself. If any of the work can be joyful and um, not light, it's never light, but that's him feeling um, he's in a place he wants to be, I think. He's having a good time. The vibrancy and color of the place are vividly conveyed in his pictures of Harlem street life. They instantly evoke an extraordinary time and place, the birth of America's first genuinely confident, exuberant black culture. And Burrow was on hand to record it all. Not just the brash street fashions, but the importance of pose and gesture. Just by the way he stands and holds his cigarette, a man can embody the hip and the cool. 
But as in Paris, it was New York by night that really captured Burroughs' imagination. The bars, the nightclubs. We went to the Savoy dance hall the other night, Burroughs wrote about his time in Harlem. You would go mad. I've never in my life seen such a display. And the women had to be twirled round ten times. It's most extraordinary. Burroughs himself couldn't dance. He could barely walk. But in these pictures of his favourite Harlem club, he managed something very much like dancing with the paintbrush. There's a tremendous giddy energy about this panoramic watercolour of the Savoy dance hall. It's a pictorial fantasy of being thrust into a mass of writhing, cavorting bodies. Burroughs' art mirrored the world that he was observing. Burlesque shows in Paris, whores and matelots in Marseille, and dancing black couples in New York. His eye was drawn to them all. I have the feeling the one place he was desperately trying not to look was within. But no one can avoid confronting reality forever. How do you paint? Do you, do you make notes or what? What do you do? I paint it straight onto a piece of paper. And the experience of travelling to one particular place, perhaps his favourite place of all, would force Burrow to face the world in a far more naked and serious way. That place was Spain. Burrow travelled light. He didn't plan his journeys. He himself, it seems, sometimes didn't know if he was going to go away for a week or for six months. His mum once famously said, I don't know if Edward's gone out for a packet of cigarettes <laughs> or if he's gone for a journey across Spain. He wouldn't tell anybody where he was going, what he was doing. And unlike most English travellers to Spain, Burra really knew Spanish culture, really had a feeling for it. He could speak Spanish, uh, he could read Spanish, and in fact, uh, one of his favourite quotes, almost his motto, came from the Spanish poet Gongora. Um, whenever Burra had been away, he'd been on one of his journeys, and if someone was quizzing him about what he'd been doing or where he'd been, who he'd been talking to, and perhaps he didn't like that person, he'd take this quote from Gongora, throw it in their face. Amis solitaris voy, de mis solitaris vengo. To my solitudes I go, from my solitudes I come. Keep your nose out of my business, in other words. Burrow travelled to Spain many times during his youth, particularly in the 1930s. The journey there was much less arduous than that to America, yet in just a few days he could get as far away as possible from the terribly enclosed world of his home in Rye. Burrow was part of an entire generation of post-war Englishmen who were determined to travel to escape the monotony, the dreariness, the greyness of what they saw as safe old England. As another member of this generation, Norman Douglas, wrote, the monotony of a nation intent upon respecting laws and customs, horror of the tangent, the extreme, the unconventional, God save the king. Travel was a way out. They wanted to escape into sunshine, into colour, into freedom. Burroughs' great friend Billy Chappell captured the allure Spain held for the artist. Spain possessed every element that was most pleasing to Edward's senses, satisfying his eyes, his ears, his nose, his emotions and his taste buds. The fabric of Spanish life might have been specially designed for his pleasure. I don't want to leave Spain, he'd written to Chappell. Not till I must. Above all, Burra loved Spain's rawness, its roughness, the way everything seemed a bit seedier and seamier and rough around the edges, even than in places like Marseille. He loved the fact that the flamenco dancers in Spain were often rather past their prime, but still going strong. This is one of them, Madame Pastoria, preserved forever by Edward Burrough. What he loved about her, I think, was her brilliant, proud brashness, her determination to embody joy and song and sexiness, despite advancing years. I can't help wondering if he didn't see in her an emblem of his own determination to embrace life despite his wasting illness. And even today, when you walk in Burroughs' footsteps through a town like Granada, you still catch glimpses of his Spain, 
In fact, you can even find people who look as if they've walked or danced straight out of one of his paintings. Madame Pastoria might be dead, but long live La Perona. Burroughs' spirits were lifted by all aspects of Spanish culture, and for him, even the bullfight was really just a piece of light theatre. The death of the animal, an occasion for mass excitement. I went to a bullfight last Sunday, my dear, he wrote in a letter. It's gorgeous. All the bulls gore everybody. And do the bulls bleed? Yes, sir. And do the audience roar with laughter? The costumes are lovely. My favourite costume was vermilion trimmed with black lace. The bullfight shows Burrow drinking in the spectacle, but painting it all without any great sense of horror. Looking at it, I can't help thinking that he'd managed to turn himself into such a disengaged voyeur that there was a risk of him becoming a merely superficial artist, a lightly caricatural, rather inconsequential painter of life under the Mediterranean sun. But then came this. The greatest shift in his art and his life. It's a nightmare vision of a modern Medusa. A blanket of dead bodies draped over her shoulder. A sudden turn to darkness. Nightmare. A terrible sense of man's inhumanity to man. And then there's Beelzebub. The devil dripping blood from a weapon over a world in ruins. It's as if something had broken in his mind. What happened? What turned Edward Burrow? To understand that, I'm on my way to a town just north of Zaragoza, or what's left of it. Burra had arrived in Spain just before the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. As he later said, One day when I was lunching with some Spanish friends, smoke kept blowing by the restaurant window. I asked where it came from. Oh, it's nothing, someone answered, with a shade of impatience. It's only a church being burned. That made me feel sick. When Burra came to Spain in 1936, he found he'd stumbled into a world that was on the brink of tearing itself apart. And when the Spanish Civil War broke out, the level of atrocities committed on both sides was truly horrific. During the first few days of the war, over 50,000 people lost their lives. And the way in which they did so was peculiarly horrible. It was called the paseos, the promenades, with grim irony. And what happened was that up to a thousand people, two thousand people at a time, if they happened to be in the wrong place, on the wrong side, would simply be taken out of town and shot dead. Now it's very hard in modern Spain to get a sense of the terrible violence that, that ripped this society apart. But here you still can, because this is the town of Belchite. It was torn apart by an exceptionally violent conflict between the Republicans and the Nationalists, but they preserved the whole of this ruined city as a memorial to an atrocious time that must never be forgotten. The battle for Belchite ripped the heart out of the town. Amongst those caught up in the conflict was Maria, who was then just a child. Luego entramos en un refugio que no, no ni teníamos agua ni vino ni, ni, ni pan ni nada porque es que estaban las fuerzas y venían la, las pavas que decíamos los aviones y claro les teníamos mucho miedo. How do you feel when you return? Yo vengo pocas veces me hacen llorar. 
Luego, cuando mi padre, cuando se llevaron a mi padre, ¿eh? dos hermanos de mi madre juntos, los mataron juntos. Lo siento. The fascists won the battle for Belchite, and the town was abandoned. But what's left behind is a stark reminder of the disasters of war. And it was from this rubble that Burroughs' new art would emerge. In this one bombed out structure, you can feel a thousand years of Spanish culture uh, just going up in smoke in a flash. And when you stand here, I think you can really sense what it was that so shocked Borough about this collective descent into a kind of Spanish insanity. You know, how could a people abolish their own past, destroy their own history, a thousand years of it, in the single flash of an exploding bomb? War in the Sun is Borough's most solemn meditation on the Spanish Civil War. It's a picture full of a sense of menace and foreboding. Everywhere you look, you see details of modern warfare. Tank number 26 with its caterpillar track, an ACAT gun thrust up to the sky, shrapnel scarred masonry. And yet the picture also is very puzzling because within this modern scene of modern warfare, Borough has introduced all these characters in what seems to be a form of Renaissance costume. These figures also suggest to me that Burroughs trying to evoke memories of the era of the Spanish conquistadors, that time when the Spanish raped Latin America. And I think through this layering of past and present, Burroughs is trying to suggest that mankind is hardwired to violence. We've always gone to war. We always will go to war. History is one mistake after another that we can't help repeating. And I think that idea of history as a trap, as war as a trap, is conveyed expressively by the almost theatrical prison architecture of the scene. Look at all these heavy grills, heavy bars. These people are trapped in a tragedy that perhaps they don't even fully understand. But for me, the strangest, most surreal and disquieting detail of all is up here, where we've got a convoy of troops heading away from this Spanish sunlit scene towards what seems like an English house and an English landscape. Is that Burroughs way of asking himself whether this violence, this atrocity may not actually remain restricted to Spain, that perhaps the violence will spread elsewhere, perhaps even reach his beloved England. Within three years, the prophecy in the painting came true, and Britain was plunged into the violence of World War II. What was Burroughs' experience of the Second World War? I think it made him feel ever more aware of being trapped in this fragile, recalcitrant body, watching helplessly as the world descended into atrocity. After all, here in Rye, he was at the front line of the Battle of Britain. German planes sweeping across the channel in waves on their way to London. All Borough can do is look up helplessly. He's a bystander. What does he do? He tends his parents' garden. He helps to care for a family of refugees that they've taken in. And we know in a rather sad note from one of his letters that he buys up the town's entire supply of aspirin. It's the only painkiller he can find for his inflamed joints. Burrow was still only in his 30s, but increasingly incapacitated by chronic illness. So here we have a photograph of Edward Burrow as a young man, and he's holding a paintbrush here. And this hand here is absolutely typical for somebody with active, already fairly advanced rheumatoid arthritis. We can see swelling of these joints along here, and swelling of the other joints in his fingers, and some wasting of the muscles in his hand, and some deformity of his wrist. So this indicates active, almost certainly very painful disease. The other condition he had was something called hereditary spherocytosis, which is a genetic condition causing a change in the shape of red cells. And basically it causes an anemia, which can cause 
uh, tiredness. In fact, his mother appears to have had the same condition, so she, he probably inherited it from her. During the Second World War, during the Battle of Britain, in his lonely solitude, Burrow went deeper and deeper into this new art of darkness. He created a whole succession of chilling images, such as Soldiers at Rye of 1941, in which the soldiers of the title wear these rather horrible Venetian carnivalesque masks, bird masks, which I think was Burroughs' surreal way of suggesting that war simultaneously depersonalizes us and turns us into these predatory creatures. There's something horribly claustrophobic about the whole image, the way the, the bodies seem almost to mesh and overlap with each other like pieces of machinery on this flat expanse of paper. These pictures were gathered together with others such as the Medusa, Beelzebub, a whole host of Burroughs' new and seriously dark art. And they were put on display at the Redfern Gallery in London. And the response of the critics was immediate and very strong. Osbert Lancaster wrote in The Observer, Edward Burrough is a serious artist working with serious themes. What Burra is trying to do, unless I'm very much mistaken, is not to select and record some single aspect of the modern tragedy, but to digest it whole and transform it into something of permanent aesthetic significance. With the war, Burra's sensibility seems to have gone permanently awry. He lost the ability to laugh at the world, and the amused lightness of his earlier work more or less disappeared. Someone asked him why he no longer painted light-hearted satires of modern life, and he replied, what can a satirist do with Auschwitz? But after the war, thanks to his friendship with Billy Chappell and the brilliant dancer-choreographer Frederick Ashton, there was one place where Burra preserved something of his earlier playfulness and joie de vivre. Designs for the ballet. And James Gordon has spent the best part of the last 20 years collecting Burroughs' ballet designs. <laughs> well, it's certainly a theatrical space. It is. Wow. How many Burroughs have you got? I think there's 70 or 80. What do you think of his sense of colour? Because I'm always struck by Burroughs' un-English sense yeah, of colour. Yeah. His continental colour is so yeah. reticent. Yeah. And, you know. and these are all full of colour. I think that is just fantastic. That, but that is um, a lovely drawing. That it? really is good. And it's very into combs in the hair. And you can almost feel the brilliant iron sticking mm, to yeah. the forehead. And, and this diaphanous, her uh, nose, yeah, her <laughs> nose is great, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's really good. But being Bar across, he printed something on the back as well. <laughs> <laughs> Which is Ashton. That's fantastic. Is yeah. that Freddie Ashton? Yes. As a sort of homme fatale? <laughs> it was actually a take off of Mussolini, making a fool of him. That's a caricature of Freddie Ashton as Mussolini. Mussolini. That's gold <laughs> dust. So you get two for the price of one as a borough collector. Does, oh, yes. that, does that happen quite often? Quite often, but it's always disappointing. You look behind, there's nothing. It's very... <laughs> I don't look at these as stage designs. They're, they're works of art. And much of this art, some of Burroughs' most vibrant, intoxicating work, would have been lost if it hadn't been for James's avid collecting. Even today, Burroughs' theatrical designs are greatly undervalued. Away from his designs for the ballet, from the start of the 50s, Burroughs embarked on a period of restless experiment. He painted a number of religious pictures, in particular this phantasmagoric scene, the expulsion of the money changers, a dream perhaps of a world being purged from evil, but one that still has the texture of a nightmare the vengeful Christ half hidden at the back, the foreground dominated by wailing figures and lost souls. He also painted a series of compelling, explosive flower pictures. Were these Burroughs' way of finding life, colour and vigour after all the death of war? Were they his bouquets for those who'd died? They seem poised between celebration and something more sinister. Strange details lurk staring eyes. 
and the flowers themselves seem almost predatory. Nothing is straightforward in Burroughs' later work. I don't remember um, the paintings. I don't remember when I did them. People were always asking the date. I never can remember. Not the right date, you know. No. And I've never written the date on them, or hardly ever. I think Burrow in his later years did his very best work of all. But because it's so slippery and because he was so secretive about its meanings, you won't find it in mainstream museums or textbooks. You have to seek it out in the collections of private individuals, people drawn to the Burrow mystery, men like Frank Cohen. The thing about Burrow, you've got to understand, some things are, are factual and easy to look at, and other things are not so easy to look at. I'd love to be able to explain that. I mean, these look like bodies that are melting or something. It's sort of creating a kind of symbolic language in this post-war art, isn't it? There's the, there are the factory chimneys, which brings one to mind of things like Auschwitz, maybe. He'd, he'd probably shudder and say, oh, dearie, don't be so specific. You can depict it any way you want. As well as the enigmatically titled It's All Boiling Up, Frank owns a host of other late boroughs, including this disconcerting painting, Sugar Beet East Anglia, where all the figures have been painted as though transparent. When you get older, in my opinion, I think you can see through people. I mean, they become vacant. And I think they're just looking through people and saying how phony the whole bloody thing is. That's the way I see it. And as a self-made man who started life in the markets of the Northwest, Frank's particularly fascinated by this picture of 1949, the market. Look, she's bare-chested, that one. So what's all that about? <laughs> she looks, I, mean, I mean, you know... She's I mean, topless and she's been handed I, I, a plate of fish. The more yeah, you look, the more unreal it becomes. Well, I mean, you know, look at that one there. Something's going on in the background there in the room. It looks like a brothel or something. Can you see, like, there's a girl dancing. I mean, <laughs> you can spend an hour and a half looking at these... Uh, do you like that about Burrow, that he was so reticent about talking of his work, that, that he left it to us to guess, and well, so each yeah. picture's a sort of I, enigma I, I, that we, we, we try and fill in the gaps ourselves? I, I doubt very much if he ever spoke to him in his life, he would it actually explain what the work was about. He refused to. He refused to. He never spoke to anyone about it. Not, not, not about he, meaning. He wasn't interested in talking about his work. A turning point came in 1957 with the death of Burroughs' father. As he had watched when Betsy died, so now he watched once again. But this time the sense of loss was tempered by resignation. The dying didn't seem unduly to put out father. I stayed up from about two on his last night and he had some trouble breathing and had some whiskey and all his wits about him. Became unconscious at about 9.30 or so and didn't really know anybody, breathing quite peaceful and died at 2.15. It was as if bubbles rose from a stagnant pond. I was dreading the funeral, but it went off very nicely. As I'd had four double whiskies, I couldn't think why everybody looked so glum. Burrough faltered into the 1960s, but still pursued his idiosyncratic course through life, supported by close friend and dealer Gerald Corcoran, who'd been showing his work ever since the war. When we came back to London from Yorkshire, where my father was stationed, he became part of our lives, part of my life, for as long as I can remember. He didn't really like to talk about himself. He was much more keen to talk about the movies or the latest science fantasy book. He used to stay with a group of different people when he came to London, and each group was always worried about how drunk he got with the other group, you know, all worried about his health all the time, which was pretty awful. What do you talk about to your friends? We talk about cooking and we talk about other friends and we talk about books occasionally and we talk about the cinema and we the theatre and we talk about how terrible actors are and we talk about uh, oh, all kinds of things, you know. Never a very little about art. I just had this picture of him perched on the sofa with pungent cigarettes and a glass of whiskey. And he had huge, thick socks for some reason, because I think his feet hurt, and, and big shoes. And I was quite in awe of him, because you got a sense that he was very, very observant and knew exactly what was going on and noticing everything. And also because he was so fragile, too. I mean, you felt 
You had to be careful. The other place I used to see him a lot was at Bumble Dawson. Who, um, she was one of his early friends from art school. And there was one evening when a friend of mine who was a great hippie gave him a great big joint and he loved it. I think it took him back to his youth because in the 20s, when there was that gang of them um, from art school, I mean, there's nothing they didn't get up to. They tried absolutely everything. So he was completely sort of unshockable. But one radical change that was sweeping across the face of Britain did test Burroughs' unshockability. Let us get on with the job of building another motorway, having done everything humanly possible to ensure that we have got things right in the beginning. Do you think the countryside changed much in England? I think the countryside in this part of the country has distinctly changed, especially along main roads. Towards the end of his life, Borough became much preoccupied by the notion that mankind, with its obsession with fossil fuels, energy, modernity, machines, was almost raping the landscape that he loved. And I think this image, called Picking a Quarrel, is perhaps the image that goes to the centre of all those concerns. Man himself has become a kind of oil stain on the landscape. And in the centre of the image, we've got these bright yellow dumper trucks and cranes. And the cranes, which are scooping up slag, seem almost to be dripping it out of their mouths like blood. They're almost like automated versions of the figure of Beelzebub that he'd created to emblematize the Spanish Civil War. This is another kind of civil war in which mankind is killing itself with its addiction to petrol, to fuel, to coal. Burroughs' landscapes are evidence of his prescient environmental awareness, but they also express more complicated emotions than a simple, sentimental love of nature. His version of the natural world is a metamorphic, shape-shifting place. Hills and valleys swell and heave like living forms. The clefts made by paths or streams often resemble the orifices or declivities of a body. Skies pulse with ominous energy. Clouds haunt the land like spirits. And here, at last, Burrow uses watercolour as watercolour, painting in washes and veils to suggest transience. But I also think that Burrow's late landscapes, for the first time, present you with a world in which the artist himself is immersed. He's not that perpetual onlooker, somehow, separated from what he sees. He's plunging himself into the landscape. It's as if for one last time he wants to connect with something bigger than himself. Burrow did still travel, but his journeys were increasingly internal. He took to going on driving holidays to the north of England with his sister Anne, and increasingly turned to just one subject the countryside that unfolded before him through the windscreen. I think he knew that time was running out. In 1973, the Tate would stage a retrospective of his work. Burrow, engrossed in his landscape preoccupations, was noticeably absent from the private views. A year before, he had agreed to be filmed, but he was the most reluctant of interviewees. And you never go to your gallery openings, I know that. But could you tell us why you don't go? No, I shan't dream of telling you why I don't go. <laughs> so you come to face to face with Edward Burrow, it's like coming face to face with a blank, or face to face with a, a Samuel Beckett character who's trapped in his own endgame and just doesn't want to tell you what he's thinking, what he's feeling. I think, I think. This was Burroughs most defiant way of saying, look, if you want to know about my art, don't ask me about it. Look at the art. I never tell anybody anything. <laughs> so they just make it up. 
I don't see that it matters. It's at this point that she asks him what does matter. And I think this is one of the very few moments in the interview where you just glimpse into the into the rather nihilistic darkness behind those eyes. What does matter? To you? Nothing. There you have it. What matters? Nothing. Burroughs' very last landscapes turn increasingly morbid, as if his subject is no longer nature itself, but his sense that his own journey through the world is nearing its end. These paintings are full of a sense of passage, full of emblems and symbols that seem to suggest the transition from one place or state to another. Boats leaving for some other place, some unknown country. Cars crossing a suspension bridge, traveling to who knows where. They're very moving pictures, but in them, I feel, Burrow was finally confronting his sense of his own mortality. I think Burrow's sense of nature towards the end of his life is deeply romantic in the sense that he's not painting a stretch of the Northumberland landscape. He's painting his sense of his own impending death. The landscape resembles a woman, and at the centre of it, there's this womb-like enclosure. The eye is drawn to it. As I feel, Burrow felt himself drawn to it. He's envisaged death with a wonderful poetic sense, I think, as a form of reverse birth. He will be drawn back into this womb, into this world of nature, and he accepts it. It's a picture that's full of resignation, full of beauty, and for me also, full of a kind of heroism. On the 22nd of October, 1976, Edward Burrow died after a short illness. He was 71. So who was Edward Burrow? Well, first and foremost, for a man of such extreme fragility, he was someone who packed a lot in. Think of all he'd seen, responded to and depicted in the course of his life. He'd been a kind of 20th century eye. He'd been there in Paris in the 20s and depicted that. He'd been to Harlem in the 30s and caught all of its energy. He then experienced the Spanish Civil War and from the lonely perspective of Rye, the Second World War. And I think those experiences deepened and darkened the nature of his vision. He probably would have said, oh, I'm just a miserable old bugger. But I think he was more than that too. And right at the end of his life, in these extraordinary landscapes, I think for the first time, having so long felt that he was on the outside looking in, for the first time with the late landscapes, I don't feel that anymore. He's there. He's in nature, in the middle of it all. And of course, he's not only in that, he's also in the process of his own death, a process every human being has to go through. And he went through it and depicted his own sense of going through it with such purity, such intensity and such bravery. Mm -hmm.